We like to think Seakeeper has become minimum expectation on both 10 models, all the way from the Seakeeper 1 all the way up to the Seakeeper 40. And we're stabilizing boats over 150 feet. 150 feet? That's right. Wow. My, my family had a small 20 foot Grady White when we were growing up, and it was an offshore fishing boat in that day. So we yeah. took it down to the Gulf and, and grouper fished. <laughs> Tell me the story again, dude. I, I mean, I'm sure everybody at home wants to hear it. And yeah. Guys, this is a nutty story. <laughs> <laughs> and these big boats, like 18 reeler big weaver, 90 something foot. Like yep. They were complaining about how rough it is and we're out there in a 35 footer. You've landed on CCO's The Science of Fishing, where passion meets precision. Hold on tight as we dive in. But before we do, we would like to thank Sea Mule and Black Reef Co. for sponsoring this episode. Will, thanks so much for taking the time here today, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Mark. Absolutely, man. So, Sea Keeper, dude, this thing, this is the Sea Keeper 4, right? That's right. Yeah, this is our newest model right here. Okay, tell me a little bit about, you know, Sea Keeper, how you guys started, what the history of the company is and where you came from and where you are today. You guys are worldwide, right? Yeah, we are. Uh, we like to think Seakeeper has become minimum expectation on boats. So in our core market, we're now installed on 50% of new boats built every year, 35, 75 feet. So if you're buying a boat today, Seakeeper is something that you got to have on board. Yeah. Uh, we originally started back in 2008. That's when we commercialized the first Sea Keeper. And fast forward to today, we have over 20,000 customers on the water today. 10 models, all the way from the Sea Keeper 1, which starts at 23 feet, all the way up to the Sea Keeper 40. And in multiple configurations, we're stabilizing boats over 150 feet. 150 feet. That's right. Wow. Well, what kind of boat can you fit it in, like on the small side of things? Yeah. So anything from like I have a 26 Sportsman. Yep. They offer the Sea Keeper one as a factory option on that okay. boat. A lot of builders. We work with basically every major boat manufacturer. Yeah. So if you're buying a boat today, there's a great chance that Sea Keeper is offered as either an optional piece of equipment or as a standard piece of equipment. So okay. Scout is a good example. You buy a Scout 42. It comes with a Sea Keeper as a standard piece of equipment on board that boat. I see. So, but you don't have to buy a new boat to get it, right? That's right. Yeah, you don't have to buy a new boat. We have uh, 300 trained dealers around the world. So you don't wow. have to be just in Florida. You can be in North Carolina. You can be in the Middle East. You can be in the Mediterranean. And we have a partner in that market that can can retrofit a Sea Keeper on board your boat. That's awesome. So pretty much anybody can get a Sea Keeper and they can have a great time with it, right? That's right. That's yeah. awesome, That's man. Right. So let's talk a little bit about why Sea Keeper is so great. Some people see these things as who needs a gyro on a boat? I want to get out there and I want to fish and I don't need that. It scares the fish away, right? Yep. It doesn't scare the fish away, right? <laughs> From boats that I've been on and I've fished on with a Sea Keeper, I fish the same. I do even better sometimes. You know, we talk about being on those big sport fishes with these things on there and something about it is the omnidirectional sonar, right? Can, yep. we, can we talk a little bit about that and like yeah, how so that helps? Very specific use case there. Our, our mission is a transform the boating experience for our customers. And in order to do that, right, it means a little bit something different for all the different segments of customer bases that we serve. So Sportfish is actually a relatively small portion of the market, but it's super, super important to us. It's where our, hi our hyper users are, right? They're higher hour, they put the product through its paces and yeah. it pushes us to be the best that we possibly can be. So for a Sportfish customer, all right, comfort is really important. You're out there for a long day, you're fishing multiple days back to back in a tournament, and you want to be at your top, right? You yeah. don't want to come back to the dock drained. You're on vacation at the end of the day. You want to come right. back, be able to have a good time and still have enough gas in the tank to get out and do it all over again the next day. Yeah. So for those customers, Seakeeper makes boating more comfortable. It also allows you to fish on days that you otherwise might have to stay at the dock. Really? Uh, right. Some people love the fish, but they might get seasick. And so that might keep them at the dock uh, more often yeah. than they'd like to be. Seakeeper, you know, keeps those people from getting seasick as well. I got gotcha. And then you talked about the, the omnidirectional sonars. That's, uh, you know, new technology that's came into the sport fishing game more recently. And we're seeing uh, more and more customers when they do retrofit their boat with an omni, omni sonar, also doing the same with a Seakeeper because it increases the effectiveness in the range of those systems as well. Wow. So it helps those guys that are fishing tournaments be more locked in, catch more fish, actually. That's right. Find more fish and be able yeah. to, to go after them and try to get that bite. See? It helps catching fish. Not It doesn't deter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wish we would have come up with that, with that value proposition to customers, but it's something we've yeah. kind of learned after the fact. And we've done some more commercial military application installations. Really? 
that try to basically accomplish the same thing with bottom scanning vessels. Okay, and you guys are at all the major billfish tournaments, right? You guys have a tech there that's ready right. to roll. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so over the years, our focus at these tournaments was primarily sales and marketing focused, right? We were trying to build awareness of our product because not many people had them. I think, right. you know, if you, if you roll back the clock to 2008, people were laughing at us. They're like, what is, what's a sea keeper? Yeah. And why the heck do we want to put that big thing on our boat? And right, the more and more people became aware of the product, we've shifted our focus into how do we make the customer experience as best as we possibly can. Right. So uh, we cover about a dozen tournaments all the way from Los Sueños Triple Crown all the way to White Marlin Open in Ocean wow. City, New Jersey and Cape May. And we'll have several technicians on site and we're there to support customers. So all the okay. service is, is free of charge to our customers in warranty or out of warranty. And we want to be able to turn people around and get them back on the water the next day. You know, if you look back, you, didn't, you don't have to have a sea keeper to go fishing, right? And most yeah. of these people spent their entire, you know, entire lives fishing without a sea keeper. But today, people have to have a sea keeper on board to go out and enjoy themselves and right. have a good time. And we're a really, we're a really important part of, these, of our customers' fishing programs. And right, they, they put a lot of, uh, of money and trust into us. We want to make sure we're, we're giving it back to them. Right. That's awesome, man. So we're talking about these big sport fishes and these big, these big tournaments, but there's also the little guy out there, you know, with the 30 foot boat, with the 26 foot yeah. boat, right? <laughs> you know, how does a sea keeper improve their quality of boating, their quality of fishing on, you know, on a regular day? while you have the wife out, yeah. you know, or, you know, on a rough day where you got to run for those guys up north, 40, 60 miles out to go catch the tuna, or even down here in South Florida, going to the Bahamas. So what kind of improvement in quality of ride can we see from that? Yeah. So um, I joined the company in, in 2018. And shortly after I joined, we launched the Seakeeper 2, which brought us below 35 feet for the first time. Okay. A couple years later, we launched the Seakeeper 1, which is our, our baby uh, Seakeeper. And our goal has always been to bring stabilization down into entry-level boating. We think we can help grow the industry, right? We have a 40% churn rate of new boaters. They come yeah. into the sport and boating is not comfortable. It's too much of a pain in the butt to maintain your boat and we lose those customers. So our goal is to give people the absolute best experience possible in boating. Um, and they're the first time they're out on board the boat. And that's, that's where people come into the sport, right? Is, is they're not buying a sport fish yacht uh, for their first boat. They're buying a 20 something foot center console. Yeah. And they're not just using it for fishing. They're also using it for family fun, as you said. Um, and you know, my boat, I have a 26 sportsman and that boat's a small boat with a big boat attitude. We run oh, it yeah. 65 miles offshore. And with our two technologies, Seakeeper, Seakeeper one gyroscope and with the Seakeeper ride on the transom, I'm comfortable not only while I'm running there, but I'm comfortable when I stop and I'm either drifting or, or trolling as well. Okay, wow. So it keeps you stable even while you're stationary. That's right. And not just on the ride out. Yeah, so I, we encourage our customers to run their Sea Keeper at all times. Oh, wow. It is most effective at rest and at slow speed, so kind of up to 10, 15 miles an hour. And then above that, that's where we have our new product, Sea Keeper Ride, okay. which is the only attitude control system for boats and it reduces 50 to 60% of the roll and pitch oh, underway. Wow. So very unique and different from the gyroscope and they kind of complement each other perfectly. You can have uh, both on the boat. And you can have both on the boat. Okay, That's wow. right. So you're just gonna have a, a freaking rock out there. <laughs> just like hey, nothing's rocking the boat. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to help you cheat a little bit, right? We're yeah. trying to make it comfortable and as, as user friendly and easy as, as it can be. I gotcha. So you guys just rolled out a few different, a uh, few new different Sea Keepers, right? Can you That's tell right. me a little bit about that? Yeah, so innovation is, is such a big part of who we are. And we're not trying to look at what's everybody else doing and, and how do we make ours just a little bit better than ours, right? This is a space that we created. Yeah. We look in the mirror and we see our competition. We've got to continue to be able to beat ourselves so that we can continue to own the industry that, that we created 15 years ago. So we've launched an effort to really revamp our entire product line. And we're taking a lot of the learnings that we had, we, we, we brought on from the Seakeeper 1, and we're working it back into the product line. So Seakeeper 4 right here, and there's a, a sister unit to this, the Seakeeper 4.5. This is the DC version. The 4.5 is AC, so made for boats, the generator. This made for boats that don't have a generator, yep. which is really popular for boats, uh, you know, sport fish style center consoles. It's sort of, uh, you can't have generator yeah. on, on board those boats. And 
you know, the basic premise of it is we're packing 30% more stabilization wow. into a package that's 7% smaller than our existing Seakeeper 3. Oh my goodness. And with a 4.5, 50% more stabilization yeah. than the Seakeeper 3. So you're packing more of a punch at a smaller guy. Yeah, basically. exactly, exactly. Wow. And you look at outboard engines today and yep. horsepower to weight is super, super critical. And that's yep. why you see, you know, a certain brand of, of outboard engines really dominating the industry right now. And, oh, yeah. and we're kind of following that, that same path where we're trying to make the product as power efficient uh, as possible. Okay, I gotcha. So let's talk about when someone wants to get one of these sea keepers and they have it on their boat, what is the customer experience like? You know, is it, you're just gonna throw one on and uh, that's it. <laughs> but I feel like you guys are always involved with your customers. You guys are taking care of them. Like you said, at those big tournaments, you guys are providing technician services free of charge. So yep. tell me a little bit about the customer experience how you guys are able to retain your customer base and you know just expand the way you have you guys have done an incredible job you guys are killing it here at the show i mean it's incredible you guys have like six different booths yeah it's incredible to see man so yeah it's a it's a sea keepers are a really fun place to be you know not only yeah. are our internal teammates really excited about what we do what our mission is our customers are excited about the product right because we yeah. we change the way they experience their boat and their boat and their free time they spend on the water is, is really, really important for us. When I look at our customer base, it's kind of twofold. Right, we have the end user that's actually using our product out in the field every day, yeah. and they're incredibly, incredibly important to us, right? If, if we're not providing that performance for them, if we're not providing the quality experience for those customers, they don't want a sea keeper on board. And yeah. most people that have a sea keeper, that's not that's not the only sea keeper they're going to own yeah. in their in their boating careers. They're gonna own two, three, and it's not just gonna start with a sea keeper one. They're yeah. gonna end up in a sea keeper three or sea keeper six one day. Wow. And we keep that in mind. That's and and that drives a lot of how we we think about and we invest in the in the customer experience. But it starts before that. You gotta have outstanding B2B partners so that you can curate that experience for your end user. Right. And so we really partner with our boat builder partners and we work with 250 300 boat builders around the world to wow. install product on new boats at the factory and we have factory technical reps we have application engineering resources to make sure that they're installing the product in the right way they've got the right structure they've got the electrical and plumbing setups to make sure the sea keeper is working you know properly when the customer takes delivery of the boat and then we've also invested a lot in our dealer networks we've got okay. 300 factory trained dealers spread out around the world and they don't only refit boats but they also perform the end user service as well okay we've got two training facilities one in tampa florida and then one in lavagna italy where we in have another italy. uh yeah in italy Whoa. and uh and you actually have to pass a hands-on technical training course in order to become a certified sea keeper technician how many people do you guys certify a year roughly? Yeah, it's up uh, close to 500 technicians last year wow yeah dude you guys are you guys are cranking them out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Units and guys to take care of them. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and you have to invest that way to make sure that, that you're providing not only the performance, yeah. but complementing that with uh, the customer support that of people course. expect from a of product course. like this. In front of me, I have the Flushmaster by Seamule. This little device simplifies the process for flushing your engines. All it takes is three easy steps. Plug the hose into the device, plug the hoses from the device into your motors, and press on. That's all it takes to preserve the longevity of your motors, ensuring 100% clean water is running through them. So if you want to preserve your motors, go to Seamule.com and go pick up a Flushmaster. Let's talk a little bit about you, dude. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I mean, you're a fellow Tar Heel, right? That's right. Let's yeah. go Heels, baby. Yeah. So, Tar Heel born and bred. <laughs> yes, sir. There you go. You're from Greensboro. We were talking about it a little earlier. And you're a, you're a diehard fisherman at heart, I'd like to say, right? You yeah. were... Tell me a little bit about that. You were talking about how in the summers, you when you were younger, you used to work on a charter boat, right? Yeah. Off of the coast of North Carolina, right? Yeah. Tell yeah, me so a I mean, bit. I grew up grew up around boating and, and have always been passionate about boating. Yeah. Um, I love the fish. It can be uh, brook trout or blue marlin. I kind of get the same sort of rush out of it. Yep. But like you said, um, my, my family had a small 20-foot Grady White when we were growing up, and it was an offshore fishing boat in that day. So we yeah. took it down to the Gulf and, and grouper fished. We did a little bit of, uh, of dolphin fishing off the North Carolina coast, some as well. And as I got older, I started working on uh, one of our friend's private boats. is a, okay. a 51 Spencer out of Hatteras, North Carolina. And nice. just did, got some really you know, formative experiences uh, yeah. being on the water, but really got me passionate about not only fishing, but also boat, boat building as well. Right. What was one of the most memorable you know, moments you had while you were charter fishing out there? I mean, I'm sure you've seen some crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah, you see a lot of crazy stuff. You meet a lot of really cool people. Yeah. And, um, and it's one of the, 
the fun things about that's that kind of intimate environment you get when you're on the boat yeah. is you know you get to know people really well you know you're shooting the shit hearing about their story what their profession yep. is teaches you about how to be a salesperson also how to take yeah. care of people make sure they're comfortable yep um just a really really cool experience in that regard but you know you don't you don't forget your first uh your first blue marlin's kind of hard hard to forget yeah and how uh, big was it it was about 350 pounds whoa dude. yeah on, that's uh, a big on a tuna fish. rig and we we primarily meat fished so yeah. dolphin tuna wahoo Yep. And uh, when the billfish bite would get hot, we'd push offshore, which in North Carolina is only going from like 21 to 23 miles to 25 to 27. Yeah. So it's just getting out closer to the edge. And um, yeah, she came in on on the, the right long rigger and we had our tuna spread out. Okay. Um, and, and uh, you know, hit one of our sea witches and 45 minutes later released uh, first blue marlin. Wow, dude. That's freaking awesome, dude. I yeah. have yet to catch a blue marlin. Yeah. I'm waiting for my first. <laughs> but dude, that's killer. So... You guys released her, right? You just said, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I got gotcha. you. So what's the biggest tuna you've caught out there? Tuna is my favorite thing to catch, right? Yeah. And you guys get a shitload of yellowfin. You guys get those bluefin out there. Have you ever fished in like Moorhead when they come in real close and all that? Yeah, I haven't fished uh, out of Moorhead. Actually, I have a couple of times. Uh, my uncle owned a charter boat out of Moorhead City for a few years. Okay. And we did some bluefin in there. And we didn't catch one on the couple of trips I went on, but in Hatteras, we tied into a, to a giant. It was you know 315 pounds, yeah. so not a super super big giant, but but a big one. And uh, I mean, just such raw power on Dude, those fish. Those things are incredible, man. They are. They are. I've I've caught two quote unquote giants out of New Jersey when I was okay. up there out of Point Pleasant. 320 and 280 double oh, header wow. at the same time. Oh my god. We had six guys and we were <laughs> rotating through, man. It was just those things have some. Dude, I couldn't last more than 10 minutes. The power on them, like you're saying, is just- It's raw animal. Yeah, dude, it you is. have to keep swapping guys yeah. out, right? Yeah, yeah, it's teamwork. That's a, a little more fun than, than strapping one person in the chair yeah, and letting dude. them have at it. Exactly. So have you had any crazy experiences with clients that you remember from those days when you were charter fishing? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Let's hear it, man. Yeah, some interesting experiences. Um, Oh man. I'm sure everybody at home's curious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all kinds of things happens. You know, people, people do silly stuff. We didn't have a sea keeper on board that boat. So I remember one guy, uh, he was just horribly seasick and he just kept throwing up all over the boat and I couldn't get him to understand the concept that, Hey man, it's okay if you're sick and also do it outside. Don't do it inside the, he was throwing the up inside. He was throwing up outside, okay, but it was just God. like all over the deck on the <laughs> reels. And I'm like, dude, if you're going to, Try to put your head overboard, like get it all the way overboard. Yeah. But you know, just silly stuff. People drinking too much and and having a good yeah. time, and you know, it happens. You're out there. You're yeah, out there man. enjoying yourself. <laughs> some people don't know what's going on. You get some newbies out there, and you're way off, and it's kind of hard to justify coming back, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. I mean, when you are when you're doing it a lot like that, and even now, it's uh, you gain a little bit of a little bit better appreciation for it when you're running your own boat and yeah. all the effort that goes into making sure people return home safely. Of course. And if things get get hairy, you're gonna know when you need to pack it up and turn yeah. it around. Fortunately, on a bigger boat, right, it's a little more leeway. Um, you're a little more seaworthy than you are in, in a small center console. Yeah. But you're committed, right? You're spending all the fuel to get out there. You're not turning around and coming back in. Yeah. And some people don't understand that, right? They they think. All right, well, if I get out here and I'm not having a good time, yeah. we can just turn around and come back in. Oh, but it's not that easy, man. It's, sometimes when you stick it out, that's when the magic happens and, exactly, you, and you get that dude. bite that, that you've been waiting on. Dude, I always believe when it's rougher out there, the bite's always better, honestly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah a, lot times, moving, a lot of times it is. Yeah, man. So let's talk about a touchy subject that I heard about from you guys yesterday at okay. the White Marlin Open. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that big Allison you caught, man. Yeah. Let's, let's, tell me the story again, dude. I, I mean, I'm sure everybody at home wants to hear it. And yeah. Guys, this is a nutty story. <laughs> <laughs> so we used to fish a lot more tournaments than we do today. Yeah. Um, we had bigger demo boats then because our product was bigger. Yeah. So we had uh, a couple 35-foot demo boats at the time, and, and this would have been three years ago. No, pre-pandemic, so... Four years ago, 2019, I think White Marlin opened, and we were just kind of cobbling together some funds. You know, Seakeeper would pay our hotel and our fuel and our bait nice, but if we were doing Calcutta, nice. <laughs> it's on on the individuals to, okay. to put it together. And um, so, right, we're not professionals. We're in a, a relatively small boat compared to the fleet. What were are, you in? We were in a 35 Blue Water. Okay, beautiful uh, boat. Yeah, so Florida built uh, center console, yeah. awesome boat, really seaworthy. And uh, I think we had like seven grand that we had put together. We were gonna 
stack it in the right Calcuttas. Yeah. And um, fishing with a bunch of Jersey guys that wanted to tuna fish. Yeah. And I think the last year we had tuna fish and the tuna fishing was terrible. And so you're basically riding around three years looking for a ghost. And yeah. it's, you know, only so fun. <laughs> so this year the, the marlin bite was, was really going off. No tuna around, no big eye had been caught for like the last two weeks. And so I kind of convinced everybody, or maybe I went rogue and said, let's, let's put all of our money in the billfish categories and the small boat categories instead of going all in on tuna. Okay. So we fished the first couple of days, primarily targeting uh, white marlin. And, yep. uh, you know, we were reminded of the fact that we weren't professionals and we caught a couple <laughs> fish, but right, white marlin in that, in that setting, it's luck of the draw if you're going to catch a big one. Yeah. Um, and if you're only catching a couple and not catching a couple dozen, yeah. it's hard to find that big one. Right. So uh, we were a little, feeling a little bit defeated and we said, you know what, the best, our best chance of catching a big marlin and winning the most money is to go after a big blue marlin. Um, and there had also been a couple of Allison tunas caught, which is a, a big elephant, basically yep. over 100 pounds when their sickle fins get real big, yeah. uh, way out in the deep. So we rolled the dice third day and we said, we're going to go, we're going to go way, way out in the deep, uh, off, off the Wilmington. How far out were you? Uh, we were like 90 miles offshore. Oh, wow. So you guys were a ways in a 35 yeah. foot boat. Yeah. Little yes. center console, man. Yeah. Oh shit. So, <laughs> and I actually got to circle back to, to one, one piece of this. The second day was horrific. I mean, it was so rough. It was raining. And this is in, in August, so yeah. you're expecting it to be pretty warm. It's like 70 degrees, and you're in shorts and a t-shirt. Maybe you've got yeah. your slickers. We were cold. Like, yeah. And these big boats, like 18-reeler, uh, big weaver, 90-something foot, like yep. they were complaining about how rough it is, and we're out there <laughs> in a 35-footer. And so we had two of our, our uh, directors of engineering on board the boat on the second day, and they decided after that experience, they're like, guys, four hour run in, like we're not fishing the third day. So we were yeah. down to a small crew on the third day. We decided to go to the deep, put our lines out, and we had like primarily blue marlin spray, like plugs in the water. Yeah. And 15 minutes after we put the lines in, right short, just get hammered. And we're like, this is, a, this is a big fish. Yeah. It was on an 80 and it burned off a lot of line. And so I'd caught, uh, I'd caught a couple of white marlin earlier in the week, like I think the only two fish we'd caught. Okay. And so I was like, all right, I'm standing here next to this reel. One, that's a big fish. I don't know if I want to tie into this. Yeah. And I'll give somebody else a turn. Um, so our CEO, Andrew Sempervivo, better shape than I am. Uh, fortunately, <laughs> he grabs the, grabs the rod, did an awesome job uh, on the rod and, and got this thing next to the boat. How 30 long minutes did it take later. to get in? O only about 30, 30, 45 minutes. Okay. And uh, I mean, you look down and it's just this monster yellowfin. And when you've got one, you know, starting to show color underneath the boat and yeah. those sickles are, are shining, I mean, it, it starts to get your heart pumping. It gets your heart pumping. Yeah, man. So, you know, then you start to get a little nervous, all right? It's yeah. the end game. We got to make, make it happen Back here. Back off and, the drag a little. Uh, and, yeah, dude. keep the drag on. You don't want to, you don't want <laughs> to think it's, uh, it's go time and time to make another run. Although it did. I mean, it stripped off a ton of line on a second run really? right after we got color the first time. Got the fish back to the boat, stuck a couple gaffs right when we got our, our first shot. And I mean, it's just the excitement when you catch a fish like that, that you yeah. know is what could be a once in a lifetime fish um, and something that we also could win a little bit of money in. Right. Really cool. So we get the fish in the boat and we're taking pictures, land next to it, because this thing's just like a behemoth. Yeah. And uh, we fished the rest of the day. We saw a couple of billfish uh, out in the deep. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, I don't think that's a once in a lifetime experience pulling into uh, uh, Harbor Harbor Town Marina yep. uh, where they do the, the way station. We kept the boat at, at sunset, but pulling in there and just feeling the excitement in an event like the White Marlin Open Dude, is, yeah. is, is kind of second to none. Yeah. And uh, you know we pulled that big fish up, weighed it, and uh, we ended up winning a hundred grand. But okay. uh, sort of the irony of it all is, had I not convinced everybody to stack our money in the uh, billfish category, probably won like four hundred grand. Uh, That's a big payday, yeah, dude. Yeah. Damn. So well, at least you different. won some money. Yeah, and I think like uh, Brooke, one of our our uh, regional OEM managers, was on the boat with me as yeah. well, and he's like, "Look, dude, we got to hang out at the White Marlin Open yeah. this week. We got to fish together. We're walking away with a little bit of money." And we just beat Michael Jordan. Dude, yeah, you beat the Catch 23, <laughs> we man. We just beat Michael Jordan. And a lot of these, you know, badass uh, bill fishing crews that travel right. the world, 
So it was uh, it was a cool experience for sure. Dude, that's awesome. Were you guys up on the podium and, yeah. and all that? Yeah, we went wow. to the, the award ceremony to yeah. get our, our I hear big it's golf second check. to none over there. I haven't been yet, but yeah, I it's hear... a Super Bowl of uh, Super Bowl of Bellfish tournaments. That's yeah, for sure. man, that's incredible, dude. Wow. So any other memorable fish over the years that you've caught? You know, other than that big Allison? Yeah, uh, I mean a lot of them. Um, What's the most memorable? Or yeah, what's, I just went on a trip down at uh, at Casa Vieja a year ago in February with my uh, my dad, and my brothers. Okay. And I mean, you get a lot of shots. I think we saw we had sixty yeah. bites on sailfish. I won't disclose 60? disclose how few we actually uh, we actually oh, caught. Um, I think we we ended up we were hooking our own fish, and and um, yeah. you know, my brothers and myself we're not we're not pros, and they hadn't really done the bait and switch before, but I think we caught 30. Okay. And last day, tied into a blue marlin, and my dad got to catch his first blue marlin. It was, nice, it was really cool. That's incredible. Yeah. Dude, I got one last question for you. Yeah. What was your favorite place at Chapel Hill? <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was a topo guy. You were a topo guy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like Something that, Something about like the way the bar is set up there, you can kind of, yeah. you know, you get your uh, you get your rotations around. Right. You, weather's nice. You can get out on the porch. So were you- Got a little view of the downtown from up there When too. Chapel Hill beats Duke, are you up at topo or are you rushing Franklin? Uh, Russian Franklin. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not, not a topo then. I'm talking yeah. just like Thursday night spot was, uh, I was gotcha. topo. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. What was Friday night? Oh, Friday night. <laughs> He's not? <laughs> He's not would be a good a good place to start out on Friday yeah, or, or Sunday. Favorites. Sunday spot. Right. Yeah. I like it over it's there. It's kind of weird talking about your day, your spots for each day. Dude, it was uh, like we'd have college. them every day, man. Yeah. I don't don't have those anymore. <laughs> it's all right. We got to get back up there together sometime, man. Maybe yeah, Duke do. UNC and well, then we'll go out and fish on the out in the on the coast and OBX or something. Yeah. Man. There's some good fishing to be had in Chapel Hill, too. Yeah. I did, I did yeah, a lot man. of bass fishing at uh, University Lake there. and. Oh yeah, it's it's supposedly it was rumored to have more five pound bass than any other uh, any other lake in North Carolina, like per density. Dude, so, it's got pretty I special fished that place. Lake. Yeah. It's got a lot of big bass in there, man. Oh yeah, it's a good time. It's yeah, cool it because no one really gets to go out there except on the weekends. So it's like as students, I I believe we got access to it during the week, which was pretty sick. Yeah, yeah, I fish there once or twice a week. Really? Yeah, dude, I love it, man. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you taking the time here at the show, yeah. man. I don't want to take any more time. You got a lot of people coming by and <laughs> you guys are busy and love the product. Next boat I get, got to have a sea keeper on it, man. Yeah, let us know. We'll make Absolutely. sure make sure it happens. Yeah, yes, thanks sir. for having me. It's always fun to, to chat fishing. Obviously, it's a, a big passion and, and yes, uh, kind of what, what brought me into sea keeper, but sea keeper is fun to talk about as well Yeah, and uh, talk about how we how we relate to the, the sport fishing experience too. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. All right. All right, guys. You guys got to check out Sea Keeper. If you're here at the show, come check them out. You guys got to get their stuff. It's It changes your life on the water, guys. See you later. Thanks for joining us on CCO's The Science of Fishing. We hope that this episode was helpful and you learned something for the next time you're wetting a line. Before we cast off, a special thanks to our sponsors, Sea Mule and Black Reef Co. Stay hooked by following us on social media at Science of Fishing and hitting the subscribe button. And if you know someone who'd enjoy this, don't hesitate to share. Until we meet again, catch them up.